And that was actually a good tutorial, man. Yeah. yeah, well, they've all been, but you know what I mean. Probably been the best one so far. <laughs> oh, wow. All right, so. Well, so from now on, you know when it's going to be good. All right, so uh, that's how we can, shooting at angles, that's how we can uh, have a defect using this trig formulas. All right, we can figure out our surface distances and our depths of our indications. Okay? Right. So we're going to go into Chapter 7 now. If you... Okay. Ready. And uh, we'll try to continue on with this. So Chapter 7, we're going to talk about equipment calibration. Okay? Right. It says that equipment used in ultrasonic testing involves electronic and mechanical devices working together to accurately capture the way ultrasonic waves interact with various features of test materials. Ultrasound interaction within a given material is analyzed by measuring the strength and nature of the returning waves. Right. Equipment calibration is the process of repeatedly verifying that the ultrasonic equipment is performing as intended. Calibration is carried out at the transducer level, the instrument level, and the integrated system level. So, right, we can calibrate in three different levels. At the transducer, at the instrument, and the integrator. The frequency of calibration is based on, on practical field experience and is often mandated through consensus codes or standards, right? The frequency calibration is mandated by the procedure and by the standard you're, do, you're doing, right? You're just not going to be doing that on your own. Before tests are begun, transducers are usually checked for their general condition and performance to a specified performance criteria, such as beam angle, depth per solution, and the absence of excessive reverberation noise. Horizontal and vertical screen linearity as well as proper DV control functions are also checked, right? And we know that DVs, right, uh, is the unit of measurement for gain, right? We increase our gain in decibels, right? And our amplitude is based on decibels also. Transducer performance checks, right? Uh, in general, the performance characteristics of transducers can be measured as they relate to fundamental generation and reception of ultrasonic energy, or as part of checking their practical behavior related to the testing effectiveness. I showed you guys a picture of uh, I showed you a picture of a transducer uh, I own, and I showed you that the, the manufacturer, since they, they do a performance check on the transducer, right, and they give you the waveform, and they also give you uh, the characteristics of the, they show you the characteristics of that transducer, right? So here in the picture you can see, right, uh, the, the 20 decibels post length Right, as it's illustrated on here. Transducers performance checks. Cons consider as a standalone component, transducers can be characterized by their electrical and acoustic responses. Typical features include electrical, amplitude, and frequency responses such as relative pulse echo sensitivity, center sensitivity, frequency bandwidth, time response, electrical impedance, and sound field measurements. In analog instruments, measurements of, of signal strength or the pulse height, right, the amplitude and transit time, which is related to the distance from the sending transducer, are taken directly from your screen. And it's important in this instrument that the visual A scan axis be directly proportional to the incoming signal strength. Right, the vertical axis and the expanded time, which is on your on your base time, on your time base, which is your horizontal axis. 
On-site checks of amplitude linearity, right, or the vertical axis, can be performed by observing how pairs of pulses which differ in amplitude by some fixed amount maintain the relative amplitude difference while changing the instrument's amplification. If the amplifier is linear, the ratio of the two pulses will remain the same as the gain of the instrument is changed over its operational range, right? So if you look at what I'm going to draw here, right? This is my transducer over to the right. I, I, I send the wave. I send my 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 electrical pulse or voltage to that uh, piezoelectric material element or crystal, right? And you get that initial pulse, right? Initial pulse is right here. It goes. My wave goes in, hits on my back wall, it reflects upward, and when, when it gets back to the transducer, right, some of the energy will go in and some of it will reflect back, right, because we have impedance and impedance difference, a mismatch. So the the energy that is transmitted into the into the transducer will give you an indication on your screen, right? Let's say this indication it's 80 percent. Okay. Now, the energy that gets reflected back is going to come back down again, hit on the wall, on the back wall, and come right up here. Now, the second time it goes, right? So again, of that portion of energy some is going to be transmitted giving you another pulse right another another spike and some of it is going to be reflected back right the one that will get reflected will do the same thing and will come back again right and then every time we have less and less energy because some of well some is being reflected and re uh, transmitted and some is being some is going to be reflected the one that's being reflected back into the material because, the, because of the attenuation of the material is losing a lot of power even though you already lost by having some transmission right now the third one you're gonna have a smaller peak right so what they what they mean about this is that if it's linear right these are echoes okay this is my first echo this is my second echo this is my third echo right of the same back wall Right. It's just right. So if this one, let's say it's a 40, this one should be at 20, right? And what they what they were talking about is that if you were to increase your amplitude, your gain, right, or your volume control, let's say you you uh, you lowered it by six. If you if you if you lower the volume by six, you're gonna this amplitudes are gonna go down, right? Augie, see if you remember, or Mike, if I bring in my machine and I have this right now showing in my machine and I get my 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 gain and I bring it down six dBs or it's six decibels, what do you think is gonna happen to my indications? Augie? Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, what? Okay, I lost your drawing. But the way I was, okay, the 6 dB, what's going to happen is your indication is going to drop in size. You know what I'm saying? When it's at 80, this is my initial pulse. When it's at 40, right? If I bring my indication by 6 dBs. Your right one's going to disappear. Your 80 is going to go down to 40, to the length of the 40, 
and the initial post is going to go down to the length of the one that was 80. Okay. The 80 is going to, what happen, what's going to happen to the 80? The 80 is going to go down, uh, down to like where the 40 is. What's going to happen to the 40? It's going to disappear? No. Remember the formula 20 log amplitude 2 over amplitude 1, right? When we did this formula, we said that anytime you subtract 6 dBs, you're going to cut your indication by half. Okay. Okay, so the 40 is going to go down to 20. To the 20, right? 40. So what they what they're talking about being linear is that if you increase your if you decrease by six, right, this echo should come down to forty, mm -hmm. and this one should come to twenty, right? Okay. If this one comes down to forty and this one stays at thirty, are you do you have a a linear system? No. You don't, right? You're out of whack, so you yeah. gotta ha you gotta you gotta send it out for calibration. You're not good. Right. So that's what they're yeah. talking about. Does your initial pulse get affected too? <laughs> yes, of course. And also go down from from the 100. Will it go down to 50? Of course. So you go from 50 to 40 to 20. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, if we have it at 100, it's gonna we're gonna cut it down to 50. Right, if it's at 100, correct, correct. We're going to cut it down at 50. Okay. If, you know, and everything is, everything on your screen should be cut by half. Or, if you add 60 dBs, you should increase everything. You know, you should double up everything. Right. Or your indication should double. Okay. Correct. That's what, so that's what they mean by that, okay? That if the amplifier is linear, right, the amplifier or the volume control, the ratio of two pulses, whether it be echoes or, you know, <laughs> will remain the same as the gain instrument is changed over its operational range, right? You can see it here. Uh, you have over here by the left. You have your first echo, right? Pull up at uh, at eighty percent, and your second echo pull at forty percent. Mm -hmm. If you were to, you know, the same signals, you decrease by six dBs, right? You're gonna you're gonna go ahead and cut the eighty to forty and the forty to twenty. See that? Okay. So that's the amplitude linearity, okay? So how do you check the horizontal? Right? So these are again steps, right? So these are echoes of each other. So okay. the basic calibration steps before an inspection include Includes establishing the horizontal axis scale to correspond to the physical region of the interest in the test object. Okay? So, for example, if this is your back wall, if this is the back wall, and these are echoes, repetitions of it, of, right? The main, your main inspection area is going to be from your front surface, which is here, to where? I'm sorry, say, what was the question again? I'm sorry. If this is your initial pulse. Correct. This is your back wall. Right, the second one. No, the first one. So you have your transducer. You came here, boom. You get this one, right? Correct. Now you get a little bit of reflection. Correct. Boom, you get this. You're right. You get a little bit more reflection, boom. Right? And it starts dying out because of attuation. And also because you're losing power every time you're coming down, right? Correct. Okay. So these are your echoes. Correct. The distance uh, of right of interest of your part 
is where, from where to where. From the IP to the uh, to the initial uh, to the first back wall. Right to the back wall, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where you're gonna have. Your, so this is this represents the distance from here to here, right? The entry surface to the back wall. Correct. Okay, so that's what they're talking about here. Straight beam calibration. So for simple longitudinal wave transducers, right? Again, we're getting a piece of material. We're putting the transducer and we're sending out a wave to the other end and have it come up, right? We're shooting a longitudinal wave. It's not a shear wave. We're not shooting at the angles. We're shooting at 90 degrees. Right. Right? Uh, system level calibration typically uses calibration blocks such as uh, the IIW block and right to establish the range of thickness directly displayed, uh, displayed on your screen. So, if this block right is one inch, right, my range. What's the range on my machine right now? One inch. It's five inches, from zero to five. My screen is measuring five inches. Yeah, I can't. I couldn't see the. Okay, five inches. Right. Now all of this, because of the lean, you know, they're linear and they're right. coming down. Do all the rebounds. I would, I would guess, and I'm pretty sure that these are all echoes. Right. Right. So this is my back wall, right? Right. And these are all repetitions, right? right. Now, this repetition is going to be the second time my sound bounced, Ooh. right? And now, the distance from here to here is going to be the third time my sound reflected back into, the, into this. Mm -hmm. okay. So we can measure, right, if we want to see the thickness of this material, if we're interested in the thickness, we can measure from one peak to another peak, right? And that should be the thickness of one material. Correct? Okay. If this is our entry surface and this is the back wall, if well, I measure the distance from here to here, wouldn't that be the thickness? Right. Okay. Now, if I measure the distance from here to here, wouldn't that be the same thickness again? It should be. Right? Now, here's here's the kicker, right? Whenever you, whenever this is this is uh, a technique that we use to measure thickness. Mm -hmm. Whenever if you remember when I showed you, right, when you took that the level one ultrasound test, I, I had a calibration for thickness. Right. And I had a gate here and I had another gate here. Mm -hmm. And the machine showed you a number here, like 100, let's say, right? What I'm telling my machine is read from the point my first peak is going through, right, to the first, echo. to the second echo. So it's measuring from here to here. Right. Okay. Now. Why would you not want to use right the distance from here to here, but instead you want to check from your first reflection to your first echo? Because the uh, the delay of the uh, sound going through the transducer and everything and the cable, right? The coaxial, yeah. The here, believe it or not, the distance from here to here is going to be, gonna be a little bit more than the distance from here to here. Right. Because here it's only metal. Here we're taking into account, right? Uh, the time my 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 sound, right, or my or my pulse is going through the wire, and my transducer, right? Right. So now, we always want to use the echoes when we want to measure thickness. A quick question: If your thickness there between point, not the initial pulse, but your first and second echo, is indicating one inch, right? Okay. Why is it not, and, and the thickness of the material is one inch, okay? Why is the echo between the second point, I mean, the, why is the distance between, okay, 
I understand the first nickel is your first uh, your back wall, right? Okay. Why? And this is just a stupid question, I know. But why is your second nickel not your face? What do you mean by face? The entry point into the material. No, because it's bouncing back down. Okay, so why is it telling you a distance of one inch when the material is one inch, but it's telling you that the distance traveled was one inch? Because it divides it by two. Oh, okay, okay. Remember, you only need, you're only concerning one way, right? And the, the sound is coming down and reflecting upward. So the instrument automatically divides. You right. Get, so why are we doing so much math and stuff when everything's given to you? Because <laughs> we have to, right? Because you have to, man. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. See? This is, this is not about eating fish. This is about learning how to fish. This is learning how to hunt. Right? Exactly. But learn Anybody how can eat deer, but not everybody can hunt deer. <laughs> right? Yeah, better, better yet, everybody can eat a salad, but not everybody can grow the vegetable. Correct. That's what that's what the guy, one guy told me at level three. He said, that, you know, that's the difference between a person that doesn't know and a person that knows. And and he, when obviously he was mentioning more towards the level three, he said, right. when we're going so deep into math and all this. He said the difference between a level one and a level two and a level three is that the level one and level two can look at the clock and read time. Mm -hmm. The level three can tell you how that clock does it to read time. Right. So, I'm am teaching you how to how to how to know that how to how how that clock is reading time. Right? right. So, so yeah. So, anyways, we're going two ways, right? We're going down and up. So we're dividing that distance by two, and that's why your echoes are always the same. Now, your initial is always going to be a little longer. It's going to take a little longer in time due to that cable. So you want to use your repetitions, right? And I use my alarms in my machine, right, to get the distance from wherever my spike goes through, right, to to the other to the other uh, echo that's crossing my alarm. So then we have a straight beam sensitivity blocks, right? So we have two types. We have uh, distance. Amplitude blocks. And then we also have area. Amplitude blocks. Area amplitude blocks? Correct. Now. The distance, the difference between these two is that distance amplitude blocks, right? They all look like this, like like this block to the right. So what they have is they have a hole, a flat bottom hole. That's what they call it. If there's a drill hole on the bottom, right? And it's flat. This this here is flat, right? So what you do is you put your transducer here, on top of this, and you want to be able to get this reflector, right? The sound coming back from this hole, but also the sound that's around it coming to the back of it, going back into the transducer. Right. Okay. So you're going to see something like an initial pulse. You're going to see the sound coming out of here, and then the sound around it, you're going to see another echo, right? and another spike. So this is going to be your initial pulse, right? This would be the energy reflecting off this reflector or this flat bottom hole, mm -hmm. right? And this second spike would be the energy around the flat bottom hole that hit. You know, if my transducer is bigger than my flat bottom hole, Right. But not all the energy is going to hit the, here. Some right. of it is going to go to the to the side. Be like your discontinuity and then your back one. Now, if I put it here, my transducer, well, all my energy is going to go to the back, and it's not going to touch my my flat bottom hole, right? Right. So I would expect this to go away 
and just keep this one. Right? So with distance amplitude blocks, that my 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 flat bottom hole is gonna be always the same. Okay. The the area of my flat bottom hole, of my reflector, is gonna be the same. What's gonna change is the distance from my top surface, my entry surface, to that reflector. So here on the left in the drawing, you can see this is a distance amplitude blocks. All of them have a little hole drilled, right? And that drill hole, that flat black that, that flat bottom hole. It's going to be the same size in all of them and the same diameter. What's changing is the distance from the surface, from the top surface, to your reflector. Right. And the reason why you want to have these blocks and look is because you want to take into account attenu attenuation. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, area amplitude blocks are different. They are all the same length, right? So all your blocks, imagine, are going to have the same length here. And this is going to be the same, drilled to the same depth. Now what's going to change is the area of your of your reflector. So one may have an area like that. Another one may have an area bigger. Another one may have a bigger reflector and a bigger reflector, right? And now you want to check is for how sensitive you are on your on your on your on your reflectors, right? How small of a reflector you can can you pick up? Okay, at a, at a set distance, right? So in distance amplitude blocks, my holes, my flat bottoms holes, are drilled at the same at the same. Uh, they have the same reflector size. Right? What changes is your distance of your from your reflector to your top surface. Right? And in my dis in my area amplitude blocks, what's gonna change is the area of my reflector mm -hmm. and the area is gonna and the distance of sound travel is gonna stay constant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all the flat bottom holes, right, are measured in sixty fourths of an inch. The area of the reflector, this area. So, the, uh, this, for example, right, this means that these numbers will say it's made out of aluminum 7075. That's the alloy. The area of my reflector is going to be 550, 564 of an inch, okay? And the metal distance from the top surface to my flat bottom hole is going to be three inches. Okay? So by looking at these numbers, you can tell, right? So for example, all these numbers here that you see written in these blocks will give you this information. What material they're on, what size of your reflector you have, and how far are you from that flat bottom hole. Okay? So, the sensitivity for of the system is adjusted based on a standard reference reflector. Both side drilled holes and flat bottom holes are used for this purpose. As shown here, there's two sets, right? There's the amplitude and the distance ampl and the distance. And this one, what do you think this one is? The one on top. Distance amplitude or area amplitude blocks? Distance. Distance, right? Because all the distance, right? And we know that the 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 hole, the, the reflector, it's always going to be the same right. in all of them. What changes is the distance from your entry surface to your flat bottom hole. Now, on the bottom, these are area amplitude blocks. They have the same distance to the hole, to the flat bottom hole. What's going to change is the size of your reflector. Right, right. Right. So, for example, right. This here are this distance amplitude blocks. This three, or are this area amplitude blocks? 
Uh, I'm sorry? These three blocks. Right. A, B, and C, are they distance amplitude or area amplitude? Area. Area, right? Because what's that what's what's changing is the area of my hole, the diameter of my hole. Right. And why are they flat? Why don't we want our our drilled holes to have this shape? If we get a normal drill and, and, and they're rounded like this, concave, right. this, the reflect this sound will not reflect back to our transducer. Right. It'll probably bounce someplace else, right? Yeah, you're going to have a skewed reflection. Right. So you want to have a flat bottom hole. Right. Okay. So in this case, if you put this transducer, okay, they're all the same transducers. If you put this transducer over block A, right? you would probably get an indication this high. Now you get the same setup, not changing anything of your gain, right? You come and you put it on top of B. Well, when you put it on top of B, now your indication is going to come down to the B level. Right? And now maybe you start getting a back reflection, a back wall reflection. Now you put it over C, and now your indication drops even more, and your back wall will get just bigger. Right. Why? The reason is because you have more, you, more beam or more wave that reaches the, the uh, back surface and rebounds, uh, reflects back to the, to the transducer. Right. So that way your 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 back wall uh, indicator is higher and goes up because you get more more sound wave going down and bouncing back up. Right. Because your yeah. your 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 indication or whatever. I'm gonna call you discontinuity, you know what I'm saying? Is okay. Yeah. Because you have a bigger diameter flat bottom hole. Right, you're having more energy being reflected back, mm -hmm. and because you have more energy, your sound, your spike is going to be greater, or higher in amplitude. That's when it hits. That's when it hits. That's the, when it hits the uh, the, uh, the well, flat bottom hole. Well. Right now, in this case, we have a smaller area, so is the same energy that's being reflected off of this flat bottom hole going to be reflected off of this one? No. No, right? Because it's smaller. It's going to be less. The other the other energy is going to come, it's just going to go through. Right? It's just going to go, keep on going to the back wall. Correct. Right? And here, even more is going to keep going to the back wall, Correct. and less is going to touch that. So that's why it drops. Now, you also have to keep in mind that as more energy is hitting the back wall, well, the greater your back wall is going to get, right? And the less this spike is going to get, the shorter in amplitude, right? For example, my back wall here in this example, right, is smaller compared to this one where it would probably be bigger. And this would be probably be medium, my back wall. Right. Right. But my spike in this one would be much greater my hole, in this one, it would probably be half, and in this one, it would probably be a little bit. Right? Correct. Now, this one. What are, what are these blocks? What do you mean? The, the, the... Are this area amplitude or distance amplitude? Distance. Distance, right? Yeah. Why? Because that what's changing is the distance from the top surface to the hole. Right. Now, are all these flat bottom holes the same size? Yes. They are, right? Yes. Now, if you were to put one on top of the other, look, block A would give you this indication. Right. Block B would give you this indication, and block C would give you this indication. Why do all three change? Because 
in block A, you're getting more sound re rebounding or reflecting back to the transducer. Why are you getting more sound? Because it's a less distance to the uh, to the hole. What does the distance have to do with that? I'm sorry? What does the distance have to do with that? What do you mean the distance? You're talking about the distance between here and the reflector. Right, the reflector face and, or the reflector and, and the... Uh, so basically it's the time, the time travel. So because you travel less, you have more higher amplitude? Yes. Okay. The reason why you get a higher amplitude in A versus C is the distance, right? Right. And the distance is because the attenuation factor, right? Due to attenuation, the more you travel, the weaker your, your signal gets. So I was you correct, know? right? You were correct. Okay. But it, it's because of attenuation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's not only about the distance. Yeah, it's the distance, but why the distance, right? It's because right. of the attenuation factor. Right. As you start getting, as you start having longer and longer sound wave, uh, sound path. The attenuation right? weakens the signal. Weakens the signal, right? You have more resistance. Right. And because of that, right, it's going to get smaller and smaller, your indication, mm -hmm. right? So you're using this to see, you know, how far you can go and still have a good, you know, a good signal based on your on your gain, right? So if let's say that you need to have, you're expecting your, your thickness, you know, you're expecting your material, right, or your crack to be at this depth at, as the one in C, right? Well, maybe, right, uh, it's... It's it's a good idea for you to crank up your your gain to bring it up to somewhere like 80 or 100 percent where you could have a more defined right mm -hmm. a more defined uh, indication because imagine if you have this size hole and he's giving you this small indication what happens if when you check your material you're the same you're at the same distance. But now, instead of having this, you have a quarter of the size. Your your indication, it's a quarter of the size of this hole. Then it's gonna, it's not, it probably won't even show on your screen. Right. I mean, you you probably be just probably it's seeing a little a line. Nothing. It may not even show up at all. And you might think it's a hash. Exactly. Right. So in that case, you would you would crank up your gain, right? to maybe 80% so that if you have something, right, now the, the specs are going to tell you all this, right, there are the ones that are going to say you have to crank up your gain or, or you're going to leave it as it is, okay? Mm. And so if you were to draw a line Okay. Of these different things, it's called a DAC curve. Okay. DAC curve means distance, amplitude, curve. Want to pick up? Distance amplitude curve. No. No, it's all wrong. Yeah. I'm warm. Fuck. <clears throat> what happened? Hey, the post. Come on, Remember the key's not there. No, I mean the key. Oh, okay. Okay, so it's a distance amplitude curve. Right. That's if you draw right a line that intercepts the peaks of of this hole, of this flat bottom holes. Right. Okay. At the, of our distance amplitude cur uh, blocks. Right. And now the machine has a setup that is called the DAC. 
right? And you could draw this. And on the machine, they have a, 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 this setup that is called the distance amplitude correction. And what that does is any indication, okay, that's here, it cranks it up. It'll automatically by itself crank it up to 80%. All right, it'll increase the gain of your indications to show everything at 80%. So mm -hmm. that if you get a small defect, you can clearly see it versus what we were talking about. Okay. Right. So that's but that's something in the machine, right? Okay. But, but all we gotta know is that if we make that, if we if we if we are. Uh, Intercept those lines. We're gonna uh, we're gonna draw a distance amplitude curve. Okay. Uh, why am I frozen here? No. Uh -oh. Okay. So the response curve derived from the distance amplitude hole reflections become the basis for evaluating readings taken during actual test of the test specimen, right? And this would be our DAC curve, right? A to B to C. When using calibration blocks for ultrasonic testing, the required sensitivities based on the size of the... Yeah? Sorry, man, I gotta step out because I just got called. Okay. And um, and I'll, I'll hit you back uh, not today, later tomorrow. I, I think tomorrow. All right. Well, we're gonna have this video online. Okay. Are you gonna move on to the eight, or are you gonna stay there? I'm probably no. I'm just gonna do uh, chapter eight. But we still have. I'm gonna do chapter seven only today. But okay. we still have half the chapter to go. Maybe three quarters of the chapter. Okay. Okay. Oh shit! I'm not gonna be. All right, Juan. All right, man. No problem. Man, be safe. All right, Augie. Yep. Ready for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just uh, I need to go here in a little while too. <laughs> but, All right. Well, just let me know when, and we'll we'll stop it there. Boom. Okay. Yep. So I mean, let me let me speed up a little bit. So we use calibration blocks, right, in UT, right, and the required sensitivities based on the size of the reference reflector. Typically, a, a flat bottom hole or a side drill hole, as shown here on the notch, right? So, and here in this block, if you cannot see it, it has a little notch. Mm -hmm. And that it's simulating a flat bottom hole. So, mm -hmm. you should be able to pick up the indication from, because of the size of the transducer, you should be able to pick up the distance from here to here, the distance from here to the back here, and you should also pick up the distance from here to the from the reflector back. So you should get three different your initial pulse, right? Your defect or your notch. You should get another one from here, and then you should also get another one from your back. Okay. Got it? Are you? Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. I see the initial pulse. Uh, do you, uh, your lengths? Uh, the lengths on your on your pulses. Okay. You ready for this? Yeah. Watch this. I actually went ahead and I took a video of me doing it for you. Good. Okay. So I have my range at about 10 inches, right? So I'm telling my machine, show me 10 inches from 0 to 10, right? Okay. This is what? My initial pulse, right? Right. Okay, you see my block? Right. You see the notch? Yep. All right. If 
I don't think this is the video I wanted to show you. Okay, here you can see the notch. Right. Okay. Right, you see the notch? On the bottom, yeah. Okay. And this is called the IIW block. Okay. My range, I have it set at 4.22 inches, meaning from here to here is going to be 4 inches. Okay. Okay. Do I have a notch on the back here? Mm hmm No, right? All my sound is traveling all no, the way to the no. back here and coming back up, okay? Okay. So this block, it should be about four inches. Take, right? If my range is from zero to ten is ten inches and my spike is showing almost at ten, then this is about four inches. Okay. Okay. Look what's happening. Two spikes are start are starting to come out. Okay, as I'm sliding it to the left. Now I have three spikes. Okay. The first spike is the reflection of what? The first spike on the left? Yeah. Well, the, the one on the far, far left over here is your initial pulse. Okay. okay. The one here? The one with the arrow is... Okay, the one with the arrow is now. It should be... I mean, you're not over the... Uh, I, I forget, guess... Forget about my hand. I mean, in the sense that don't be so precise about it. Okay. Being the probe there, where do you think this is? This notch is from? Where do you this notch... This indication is from? That indication should be your your discontinuity there. Is it the, the top of the notch? Is it this surface here, or is it this surface here? It should be the top of the notch, shouldn't it? Why? Because it's closer to, to the... It's closest to the transducer, right? All right. So that is my notch. Okay, yeah. The second one would be what? The second one would be to the right, of, to the to the left of the notch. Right here, right? Correct, because it's the next one higher, or the right. next one lower away from the uh, from the transducer. And the last one would be when my far in the case far, line. Yeah, your back wall. So look, so I keep sliding it, maybe, right? And look, my back wall just went lower in amplitude uh -huh. right? because now I have more sound over that notch. Right. Oh, oh, not over the notch, over here. Right? Because the notch is very small compared to the size of my transducer. So now I have a little bit of energy coming here, maybe touching this bottom corner. Right? I have some energy. The first peak over here would be some energy off that reflector. And all this amount of energy is from here. So the majority of my transducer is lined up with this surface, right? Surface to the left of the notch. Correct. Right. And if I keep going, my notch is just going to get smaller and smaller. Why? Because now I'm not over the notch anymore. Right. Maybe I have a little bit of the transducer over the notch. Right. But I have maybe 90% of the transducer on top of the area after the notch. Okay. And if I keep going, my notch just died. You lose it completely. Okay. Why? Because I'm not on top of the notch anymore. Correct. And if I come back up, my notch starts appearing. Right. And now I look my three indications. And if I keep going, back and forth. Okay? Right.
So can you picture it better now? Yep. Awesome. Now, this is me shooting. OK, let me ask you a question here. Maybe you know about this. What is this? That's your coupling. That's your coupling, right? Yeah. OK. I have it. I have my range at 10. So from 0 to 10, right? And I have my delay at 0 meaning that I'm not sliding this back and forth. Uh, 0 would be here, and 10 would be here, 10 inches. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use a transducer at a 45 degrees. OK. 45 degrees, I'm shooting, hitting this curve dead on and it's bouncing back into my transducer and it's showing at four. So if if my range is at ten, my indication is a four, right? How thick would I consider would I think or or, or how how many inches is it from here to here? Four inches. Four inches, right? Yep. And this eight? Okay, it's actually a second. Okay, you see at five, you have a little notch here. Mm -hmm. You see that? That's because my sound came over here. It came back and it reflected back into here. And from here to here is one inch. So it came four. Some of it will reflect five. Some of it will go back in, show it to you. Come right back out. Eight is the second bounce, a repetition from this one. And then nine would be the last hit from here. OK? Mm -hmm. That's why you see not just here to your right. It's because your indication is coming here. Boom, bouncing. And the one that does, because it's at an angle, right, it's not just going to bounce. It's going to bounce to the right. If I were to put this transducer further to the right, because this is a groove, it's not, a, it's not all the way through the material. If I were to put it further out, uh, my indication, I would lose this indications because it would actually come down and it would just go, keep going through my material. Right? You have no reflector for this to come back up. OK, you see how it's a groove? Mm -hmm. So if I have it really close to the edge, I'll have the sound come, bounce, hit this, come back up, and show it. Right. Now I'm shooting this way. So if from here to here it was four inches, let's see how, how, uh, how many inches is it from here to here. How many inches do you think? I, I can't see the instrument in the back. It's no. about it's about one. Okay. Right? Because Okay. So two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these notches are from this repetition that's coming from here. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's important for you to know. Okay. Do you see how I moved it further out? Mm -hmm. I lost my notch because it's not drilled all the way. Now my sound is traveling all the way down. Right. Okay. Eight plus over eight inches deep. Eight inches. So it's probably going like here and hitting something on this side of the block and coming back up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm hitting my notch. Right. Right. 
I am probably hitting something over here. Remember my echoes? Yep. What I'm doing is I'm trying to measure from here to here. So I set my I set my machine at ten inches my range. Range my ten inches, right? My first echo would show close to what four, right? Because this this block is four inches. Right? My first one with my first repetition would hit four, right? Sound would be transmitted and the sound that's transmitted back into the transducer shows here, right? Mm -hmm. The one that gets reflected comes back up down down here and up into the transducer. And that second echo would be this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if you move this screen to the to the left with your delay, you're gonna see that there it should be at this distance you should have another at the same distance, you should have another notch, which should be the third repetition at a smaller amplitude, right? Got it? Yep. Right? And you could also measure, instead of measuring from this peak to this peak, you could measure from this peak to the next one, and it should give you the same reading, right? Yep. It's the same material. Right, so these are my gates, my alarms, and I'm telling it measure from the point where my where where we're gonna cross that alarm. So that's why you have these little arrows here. Right. Now I put it here. Okay. Look what happened. Now it's 3.65. It's not 4 anymore. Hmm. Why? My indications shifted to the left. Why? Because we don't have as much material. Right. Right. Now we went back to the right. 4 inches. I'm back over here. Oop, 3 inches. You see how they're shifting to the left and to the right? Yep. Okay. Oh man, we got a bunch of slides to go. Uh oh, we got 39 slides. Crank it up, buddy. Crank it up. Got about 40 minutes. Okay. All right. So this is this, well, we already got this slide. Side yeah. for angle beams, right? We have what we do is uh, we have uh, side drilled holes, right? So if you have a block here. And you have a transducer, right? And you're shooting at, at an angle. You could drill a hole. Imagine your block, it's like this, right? You could drill a hole that goes all the way through, right? So when you hit that hole dead on, you're going to reflect back, right? So we use side drilled holes for angle beam calibrations, right? And the good thing about the side drill hole is that regardless of the angle you're using, you're always going to have the same amount of energy coming back, right? If, 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 if you're shooting at, if you have your transducer here, and you're shooting at 45 degrees, is this, you're going to have the same energy as if you were shooting at 70 and you hit it dead on, right? Because this, it's the same curvature, the same radius. Right. So it says calibration blocks with side drilled holes have an advantage. The amount of sound reflected from a side drilled hole remains the same regardless of the transducer angle. Right? That's because obviously the radius of our hole is not changing. And this would be a block with side drilled holes. Right? This hole would, would be drilled either all the way or partially, as you could 
see it here. Mm -hmm. right. And again, this is how you can calibrate, right? You can calibrate, right? And we, we already know how to figure out the distance from my transducer. Remember, it's not from the front of the transducer, but from the point of exit of right. my transducer. By the way, the transducers, they have an index line. That's what they call it. Right. And, OK, you see this transducer? Right. This is the wedge. And you see this line? Yeah. <laughs> this line over here, where it meets the material, is a line where you shoot where of, of entry, of the sound entry. Right. OK. So the surface distance would be the from this very point towards the in front of the towards the front of the of the transducer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as we had said, right, that line would be here. Okay. So from here you measure, and we already know how to figure out the distance, right? And we already know also by having this sixty degrees transducer. We can figure out, knowing the thickness of this plate, we can figure out how deep my indication went, right? And we also could figure it out, even if it's not in the first leg, but also in the second. The block must be long enough to allow for a full skip distance. We know that a full skip is what? A whole, this is half a skip. Mm -hmm. Right. First triangle, yeah. And so half skip, half skip, so this is a full skip. Why would you want a full skip distance? If you want if you're checking like a like a weld or something, you'll see why. Mm -hmm. uh, the block must be long enough to allow for a full skip distance for the transducer, but may not be less than six inches. As the thickness increases, the block will need to be longer to accommodate for longer skip distances. Right? Again, we have our transducers right, shooting at different angles to pick up our holes right? and at different depths. Okay? We could use, uh, we could bounce off the surfaces to pick up uh, indications. So if you have, let's say, no access to this area, okay, and you need to find a defect here, could you find it? Yeah, sure. Maybe you won't be able to find it straight, but you could bounce off the surface and pick it up. Right? Uh huh. So these are advantages of ultrasound, right? And you can see graphically here how you can how you can see your notches, right? Next six that we show here, right? And what this bottom thing is, imagine having this block reflected back, right? Five, right? This distance here is the same thing as if you were doing it backwards. Uh, I mean, if you if you flipped, if you reflected this down. The distance you traveled from here to here and up this way is right. the same thing as if you just had a straight line. If you reflect this down, okay. Now, something to keep in mind here is that in in the uh, let's see in the one quarter hole, right? You would have an indication showing up over here, smaller, right? Why? Because it's the longest path you have out of all three, right? Then the second longest would be six, right? And that's why you have a little more amplitude. And the shortest of all would be five, because you only have a quarter more of a thickness past the full thickness of your of your block. Okay? That's why you have a little more amplitude. You got it? Yep. Okay.
So the, uh, to begin this type of calibration, the operator should maximize the return signal from the one quarter notch, right? This one, from the qu one quarter thickness, right? The depth to an amplitude of 80%. So you put this at 80%, right? And then you place it over the first gratitude. tool. So, at, now at this point, uh, the signals from the fourth locations, right, two, meaning uh, two over fourth thicknesses, or three over four, all the fourths, right, should line up over the second, third, fifth, and sixth major radicals respectively, right? So you can see one here, right, depending on the size and how much you travel, right? In some instances, the signal amplitude from the from the second hole may be higher than the amplitude of the first of the signal from the first. Right. Uh, well, we can't really see it here, but here we go. The second hole sometimes can be higher than the second of the first hole. Right, and that's because you have that uh, maybe the first hole is too close to the surface, and you don't have as much resolution in that transducer. Right. Maybe the pulse is too long. So it says without changing the reference level, the, the reference level gain setting, the peak of each maximized signal can be marked on the screen either electronically or using a China marker. And that, you know, you, do, you connect, these points can be connected to create a distance amplitude curve, right? Right. And this is the curve, this is a DAC curve, right? If, we, if we're doing a shear wave. DAC, we did it before, we did it with the longitudinal shooting down, right, using blocks. When inspecting using a DAC curve, a scan needs to perform at the gain level above the reference level. So you usually put it 6 dBs more when you have a DAC curve. When you inspect, you crank up your gain 6 dBs. When indications are discovered at the scanning level, right, the gain is returned to the reference level and carefully evaluation is conducted by the technician at, at the reference setting, right? Okay. So why do you want to increase it to 6 dBs? To make it easier on you. Read it. Right? To make it easier to read it. You're doubling your indications. Right. So once you see something, then you bring it down to your reference level, and now you're comparing it to your DAC curve. Right. right? And now they'll tell you if it, if it exceeds your DAC curve by this much or something, then you have to reject the part. Right. All indications that reach 20% of the DAC curve are evaluated to discover their type. Right. What type? What you know? If it's cylindrical, if it's planar, if it's spherical. Planar flaws are rejected regardless of the length of or signal height. Other flaws such as a slag or porosity are evaluated for acceptance according to the length and amplitude. Did the reflection touch the DAC line at the reference setting? Right. ASME is specifies that all reflectors that reach 50% of the DAC curve and above be recorded on the inspection report even though they may not produce peaks that reach the DAC curve. Okay? Mm -hmm. So here's the block you saw me use, right? And uh, here's the notch. And uh, well, it's upside down, right? And uh, we were shooting at this and uh, we said that this was about four inches remember? Right. And we also said that the distance when we put my transducer here and I shot from here to here, we said it was about, what? Four yeah. inches. Oh, I'm sorry. Four inches. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Remember, from here to here was like 3.60 something. Right. And we said that this, the machine said the distance from here to here was what? About an inch. One inch, right? So we're about correct. Okay. And this is a side drilled hole. Okay, and IIW block is the name of this block, and it's the International Institute welding block. Okay, that's what that's the name of it. And here you have the blocks. Right? They have them in different materials. This one, steel. Right. This one, for the color, you, you might think it's aluminum. And this is a plexiglass. Okay. Uh -huh. And you can use this here because it's so close to the surface. 
you see here, you can put a transducer on top of here and check for uh, near surface resolution. Okay? Uh -huh. You use this curve, right, to check your at a shear wave. And you could also see this, if you see this little things here, they're, they give you numbers, so like 45, 50, 50, right? And you could use that to make sure and to read, because remember, you're not your, your, your step wedge, right? Maybe it's 60 degrees. But because you're sliding it back and forth and it may be wearing off, as you start removing material off the surface, maybe you don't have a 60 degrees anymore. Now you have a 58 degrees, right? So you can use this block and this lines, right, to shoot sound and verify whether it's still at the 60 degrees or not. Okay, so when you line up your, your line, right, on your index line to the 60 line in the, in the, in the thing, in the block, you should get your indication. And if you don't get the maximum indication when both of these match, then your 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 wedge it's it's not at sixty anymore. Mm. So maybe you, ha you may have to sand it down a little bit and to make it be sixty again. Okay. So for example uh Okay, you see the numbers here? 60, 65, see that? Yeah. Okay. The one from here to here, if I line up my zero here, at, 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 if, I, if I put a standard 45 inch, a 45 degree transducer, and my index line, I align it to zero, I should get the maximum signal. If I don't get my maximum signal, but my, my notch, my index line is maybe in front or behind it, then maybe I'm not exactly at 45. You understand? Yep. Mm. Yeah. And you can check it from the bottom here, shooting to that piece of plexiglass. Okay. <coughs> or your side your side hole right here. Okay. This block provides the operator with many options for straight beam calibration, right? So for straight beam you can measure the thickness, right? Uh, which is one inch right here. Okay. Right. And on your screen you could actually see your initial poles, your one inch, and then you could also check the linear linearity and and you know of your equipment by seeing your echoes. Okay, and then increasing or decreasing your gain. All right, it can be scanned through the through the ten centimeter width for wider screen widths. In addition, right. The notch can be viewed from the opposite side of the block to check the transducer resolution, which is what we did, right? We wanted to make sure that we could get all those three notches separate, right? We wanted to make sure, because that's the thing. Uh, you're shooting, your transducer is this big, right? And maybe you have the same, condi this was the condition we had, right? The notch, the 4 inch, and the 365 inch, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure that for all this, you get a, a, a separate, distinct notches, rather than just getting an, a one fat notch. Okay, so that's what they call by resolution, being able to, you know, clearly differentiate or space out different indications that are closely together, meaning this one close to the one from here. Right. Sound reflecting off this. Right. So you want to make sure you get three distinct notches. So when you do, when you have a weld like this, right, uh, you might check with your transducer here. 
And the reason we had said that we want to have a full skip distance, right? And as you start, one way to check this, uh, this whole weld is to slide your probe back and forth so that you start checking the whole side of your weld, right, at an angle. And for that, you need to have at least, of axis, you need to have at least a full skip distance from your weld, OK? Hmm. And you check it from both sides. OK. OK. Uh, I had told you here, right? You have lines. This block, apparently, 70 C, right? Mm -hmm. If this is my maximum signal that I'm going to get out of this hole, my index line should match up with 70, right? Correct? Huggy? Yep. If it matches, and I have the max, the 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 the, the, the largest amplitude. Then... Okay. Either one. Yep. Okay. If they match, then I know my wedge is correct. Okay. Correct. So the following functions require the shear wave inspection to be enabled by this block, right? Identification of the transducer beam index point, right? Setting the screen range, verification of the probe's angle of refraction, right? And setting the sensitivity level. So prior to beginning the calibration using that block, the operator must determine the screen width the screen, what screen width will be required to perform the inspection? Two of the most commonly used screen widths are 12.7 and 25.4, which is 5 or 10 inches, right? just to make it easier. And what they're talking here is the range, meaning how much material you're going to read from here to the 10 line, right? Right. And we, we can figure out how many inches each division is by dividing the range by your divisions, which is usually what number? Um, either 10 or 5. You, no, 10. You usually have 10 divisions. Oh, okay, 10, 10 different individual. Yeah, right. okay. The range is either 5 or 10. So if, you, if your range is 10? It would be 1. Right. It would be 1. Each line, each division would be 1 inch. Right. If it's 5, then each division would be 2 inches. So determine the appropriate screen width. A lot of times these people will tell you what range wait, to wait, 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 wait. You said if it's five, each would be two. No, each would be half, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So to determine the appropriate screen width, uh, something I was going to say, a lot of your codes will give you what range to use, okay? To determine the appropriate screen width, the operator should determine which wedge angle is to be used. This may be dictated by the governing code or the specification, and what thickness of the material to be used. Right. So that will tell you a lot of times what a screen, uh, range you're going to use. Cautionary note: If the screen width selected is less than the full skip distance, then the far end of the second leg of the sound beam will not show on the screen and the upper portion of the material or weld being inspected will not be seen by the operator in validating the inspection process. Right? So you want to make sure you, you get the right screen width or the range. Otherwise, you would be probably not uh, looking at the whole inspection area. Correct. That second leg. All right. The signal from the 2.5 or one inch radian notch is maximized and set to the appropriate graticule on the screen display representing the one inch and the sound path. Right? The transducer then is aimed to the four inches. 
and the signal is set over the graticule representing the ten, the four inch on the sound path as B, right? By using the range and delay controls, uh, you know the difference between range and control and delay. Whoa. Huh? Whoa, range. You're talking about range, the the the, the length of the uh, of the item. Range is how much material is going to be shown on your screen. Right, from one end to the other. Right. Delay. Just five inches, whatever. Okay, delay is the, the, how long it takes you to go from one end to the other? No. The delay will do this. Look at me. I'm looking. All right. Here's your screen, right? Okay. Imagine. You, man. Right. Huh? You, man. Right? So imagine your screen is like this, right? Your range is from here to here. Correct? Okay. So, if I show you this, you're only showing what's in between the fingers. Correct. Right? Now, what happens if I have this like this? Okay. You have it there, right? Okay. So, your range is going to is going to either increase where you're going to see on your screen, or it's going to focus that area on your screen, right? Okay. What your delay does is it actually moves, it keeps the range the same, but it moves your screen like this, right? So if you're interested in having this indications at this range, you may have it like that. Now, if, if you're interested in, in maybe looking at all four indications on your screen, then instead of moving your delay, you increase your range so your screen shows more. Right. Now when you increase your 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 range because you're putting more information in your screen. Okay, so your range focuses I'm sorry, your your delay focuses your range no. to a smaller okay. area. The range, what well, it does, right? It you can say, okay, my screen is this big, right? From here to here, show me 10 inches. Correct. Well, you could tell it from here to here, show me 100 inches. Right. Right? Now, you're not going to have the same separation at when you're checking, when you're, when you're showing on your screen 10 inches versus when you're showing 100 inches. Right. Right? Right. So, yeah, it's going to be much wider. So if you want to keep your separation, right, from one to the other, you keep your range low, and what you do instead is you move your indicate, you move your screen with your delay, versus then just like compressing all these indications right. into the same screen. Right, right. You it? So your range gets more or less material in your screen. Right. Your delay moves the back and keeps the same range. So. Okay. Okay. So by using your range and delay controls as described previously, the two signals are adjusted so that they're both aligned at the proper locations on your screen. Okay. okay. So now here you have your transducer, your wedge, your block, and you have your side drill hole. You're shooting at an angle. When you hit it that on, it's going to bounce back and it's going to give okay, you. Yeah, I'm looking at you. I'm, I'm, I don't see your. Oh, your, your uh, I'm sorry. Okay, you, you have a side, a side through your hole, yep. and you're shooting it at an angle. When you hit it that on, you're going to bounce back and receive that signal. Okay? Right. And then the amplitude of the signal should be set between 40 and 60 FSH, and that is what? Full screen height, right? Okay. Uh, that gain setting is then recorded as the reference level and the reference line for the inspections performing, uh, performed using this calibration. With this type of calibration, as opposed to that obtained from the DAC curve, the acceptance and rejection criteria are based on the variations in signal amplitude related to the sound path. 
Scanning is done at higher gain settings as described in the domain code. Now, your specs is the one that are going to tell you how much gain you're going to have to put, if you get an increased gain, or if you get to decrease it, and what your rejection values are going to be, or your acceptance criteria, right? Right. So, right, when an indication is seen by the signal, uh, is magnus is when an indication is seen, the signal is magnetized is ma maximized and the amplitude is set to full screen height. That matches the set point B. This gain setting is called the indication level. The sound path and the inches, so the maximized indication is that read from the screen. With these three values, the indicating rating can be determined. The indication rating is calculated using A minus B minus C equals D where A is the indication level in decibels, B is the reference level in decibels, C the attenuation factor, and D the indicating value or rating. Let me see. Okay, we should be about to finish now. All right, so then you have different, different uh, you have a table, right? indicating your rating, right? And you can you have different uh, depending on, on your discon your discontinuity, right? Depending on your size, right? The angle at which you're shooting. So if you're shooting at 70 degrees or 60 or 45, which are, those are the most common angles at which you're going to shoot. 45, 60 and 70, maybe 30 also in aviation. Mm -hmm. right? And these are going to be the classes of your indications. Right. This is going to be for AWS, for uh, welds and stuff. You're not going to see this in aviation. Okay. The indication rating by itself is just a number without units. So to determine whether or not the indication is rejectable, the governing code or specification has to give ranges of values for rejections. A typical set of ranges might, might be a follow. Right. So an indication rating less than 5, the indication is rejectable regardless of the length. So you just have a, you just have to follow the, the table, you know, whatever indication rating you give it, uh, you look at the table, right, and you should, and your specs should tell you whether it's going to be acceptable or not. Okay, and these are just examples of how the code or specification might define the the ratings. Okay, this is another type of block. Okay, which is the same. It's a miniature block. And it's similar, or it does at least the same job of the IIW block, right? And uh, <clears throat> you could put your transducer on top of here. You have your side drilled hole, and you could actually shoot sound, right, in both directions uh, to get what, one inch here, or to get three inches shooting at the opposite end. Now you also have a scale written on the side where you could check your index mark for proper angle, right? To see if the refraction angle is it's being it's correct or not. Right. So calibrate with this block the appropriate screen width is selected than the transducer. Okay. So for example, if you, if you wanna if you wanna go ahead and, and check on your screen, right? Um. So this is your screen, right? You wanna have your initial pulse. And uh, you want to have this one inch up here, maybe here in the middle of your screen. So this is zero and this is ten. What would your range have to be? Okay, zero and ten. And what's what's the I'm sorry, what's the block size? Uh, we're shooting at one inch. One inch is shooting back, and you want to measure. You want you want your spike on your screen that at one inch it shows in the middle. So what range would you have to set your machine on? At the middle. Um, two inches, right? Yeah, because it's one inch plus one inch is two inches. Yeah. Right. Now, another scenario would be if you have your machine, right? What happens if you put your your 
your uh, your range at a hundred inches. Where would you see this indication? Oh, way to the left. You probably won't even to the, you, you will probably won't, you won't distinguish whether that's an initial pulse or your indication. Right, exactly. Right. So that's why you got to make sure that you know what. Right. So in in this case, if we if you were trying to get the three inch, let's say, well, you might want to put your range at six inches or so. Right. So be right in the So you have plenty of room for echoes, right? Right. And you have a good a good separation, right? Mm hmm So the range would expand both or, or or contract it, right? And your delay would actually move it left or right. Mm hmm Other calibration blocks. Okay. So we have other type of blocks. Uh but we won't just we won't go over those uh because they would only be used under special circumstances. Okay, they're not. Um, okay. And uh, that's it for chapter seven, I believe. Awesome. So let's go over chapter eight. It's another. It's maybe another one hundred slides. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop broadcasting this, so you guys will have it uh, tomorrow. Okay, buddy. Okay. Uh, let me stop.